Hello, this is Carl Keith, and welcome to Odds and Ends. This is a, a new uh, program from the Montgomery County Auditor's Office where we uh, look at different things that we, the Auditor's Office does, and our different responsibilities, and talk with different people in the community that have a, that impact uh, us with the Auditor's Office, people in the, from our office and people outside the office. So. Um, we're excited today to have with us uh, John Zimmerman, who is the uh, Vice President of the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center. Thank you, John, for joining us today. And I've known John for a number of years. And uh, so, John, let's just get right into it. So how long have you been with the Fair Housing Center? I've been there about 22 years. Okay. And, and how did you get into that? When I got into Fair Housing and I ran into Fair Housing, I was working at Reed Memorial Hospital in Richmond, Indiana. And I was attached to human services, and uh, we were in the middle of the AIDS crisis back in the 90s. And we had a whole bunch of folks that uh, had HIV and were getting thrown out of their houses. And we were like, you know, uh, didn't know a lot to do about it. So, and we tried to call Indianapolis, we didn't get much, and somebody said, call Jim McCarthy in Dayton, Ohio. Okay. And right. I actually lived in Dayton and commuted out to Richmond. And uh, we called Jim, and he taught us about fair housing. Okay. And now, he, Jim McCarthy is the president of fair, yes, the, the Jim's center a, here in Dayton. Yeah, and he's still my boss today. So what happened was that after uh, two or three years, I saw where he posted a job at the fair housing center. And wanting to uh, be in civil rights, I thought, wow, this is my chance. And so I applied for that job and I got that job. And, uh, then I've got a few promotions since then. I was just an educator back then. Uh, and I'm now the vice president and, uh, I have just loved uh, really, uh, becoming a fair housing advocate. Well, I know you said you, you, you're an educator. I mean, I've heard you give a lot of speeches and, and presentations and you do it very well. And I, I'm assuming that's part of your job that you really enjoy. Uh, but what other types of services that the Fair Housing Center do, does? So the Fair Housing Center, we have two main lines of business, and our mission is to eliminate housing discrimination in Dayton, in the Miami Valley, regionally, and across Ohio if necessary. And we do all of that, and we do it in two ways. We help victims of housing discrimination uh, file a complaint and get relief. Uh, and uh, also in enforcement, we also work in systemic issues. And so we worked ar around issues that had to do with uh, foreclosed properties that were not maintained well. And we've taken some people to task for that, some large purveyors of, of housing and mortgages. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we do, of course, is what I do is we educate and we educate both consumers and then all kinds of professionals. We have either produced on our own or collaborated with someone to give continuing education to architects, to city planners, to code enforcement officials, to uh, social workers, realtors, landlords. County auditors. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so anyone whose work intersects with housing. And uh, so all of that, those two lines of business, education, enforcement, uh, help us achieve our mission of eliminating housing discrimination. Let's talk about the redlining issue a little bit, because that's one of the things that I've heard you recently do is presentations on. I saw you do a presentation over at the uh, new uh, uh, West branch of the Dayton Metro Library not too long ago. And then I've heard you do the presentations before, and uh, you've been in our office recently and saw the, the quilt that's in our office. But let's talk about the redlining issue a little bit. And I know you, you know this issue really well and have, have, have studied it quite a bit. And uh, so kind of just fill us in a little bit about what, what redlining is and, and the history of it just a little bit, just briefly. Okay. So in the 1930s, after the Great Depression, there were just foreclosures everywhere. And <clears throat> banks were struggling, and the federal government came up with a plan to uh, create a department called the Homeowners Loan Association Corporation, uh, and HOLC, Homeowners Loan Corporation. And what that corporation wanted to do was to make sure that banks succeeded. And so someone there thought that, well, what we ought to do is to map all of the cities and show lenders where it was appropriate to make loans that would be successful and where it would be hazardous. 
And so they divided all of the metro areas up into four colors. Green, uh, which were the areas that were uh, called hot spots and lenders could make their maximum loans. Okay, then there was blue and there was yellow, or uh, blue, yeah, blue and yellow, and they were not as great as green, and then there was red. And lo and behold, we found out that green areas were all consisted of white people. And then the yellow and blue were diversified, and in red is where the majority African American and black folks lived. And what was problematic about this, and it still remains today, is this is that that mechanism that they set up to help banks make successful loans, that methodology creeped into every decision that was made in those geographical areas. So red was termed hazardous. And so when municipalities or when banks were gonna fund a hospital, it might not go to a red zone. When they thought about things like, where are we gonna put the interstate highways? Well, we don't wanna put it in the green zone where all of our banks have made all of these great loans that are successful, so let's go put it in the red zone. And they would put it right through an African-American neighborhood. They thought, where do we put sewage plants? Where do we put refuse uh, processing plants? And they were like, well, we can't put it in the green zone, okay? So mm -hmm. they would put it there. And so they also, when they cited factories, and the factories that, that were cited and they made loans for were the ones that were the worst pollutants. And so we live with that legacy of redlining and those areas have these things in, in common from city to city. Today, it's just a far reaching impact, right. far beyond just housing. Right, and so today we see that those areas have the highest rate of infant mortality. And in Montgomery County, we are, uh, you know, uh, have a rate that's almost twice the rest of the state. Uh, it's the highest rate of diabetes and heart disease, asthma, uh, all of these things uh, you know, persist and those areas were purposefully disinvested. Uh, and so the, that uh, the legacy of redlining uh, has been that we have uh, great areas of opportunity and great areas of disinvestment. And um, it's something that we have got to uh, move past and we have to see somehow, some way to get those uh, areas reinvested in uh, so that they be can become decent, sanitary, safe, and healthy communities. I think um, um, people think sometimes that the, the way they see this in their community, they see this in their city, they can see the differences in the different neighborhoods and everything and they, they think it's purposeful or, or that it was accidental or just that was just the way it happened to be, it, that, it, that there wasn't some strategy to it and there really was. Uh, like you said, you know, these, these maps were done back in the 1930s and so it wasn't until what the the fair housing act of 68 68 Correct. that really outlawed this uh, but you know that's a long time and so we're still living with this legacy of it uh, as you said and it just keeps going on and on so i want to talk about the quilt okay uh, so um uh, this this map from 1937 for dayton mm -hmm. and of course the, dayton's not unique in this there are cities all over america right uh, had these they had these red lining districts um, so we have this 1937 map, and I think it was Sinclair Community College is really ones that commissioned this. They, they commissioned a group, uh, uh, the Art Quilt, Miami Valley Art Quilt Group, I think, and, and wanted them to do a quilt uh, as a work of art that, uh, out, that was made as the, this map. This 1937 redlining map was used as the template. Um, our office... Uh, they contacted our office and our mapping people, the auditor's office, and we were able to give them a template to use. And then these two ladies created this incredible map. Uh, and uh, we recently, they recently finished it and they allowed us to have it on display. So it's on display in the auditor's office currently. I know you stopped by the day we, we announced it or unveiled it, I guess. And your thoughts on the map itself? Uh, 
Well, or, I the was really, quilt, or the quilt, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I was really stunned because <laughs> when you look at the 1930s map, the red-lined area is really kind of pink. Mall, it's or kind of pink. Yeah. <laughs> but they did this crimson red. Yes. And all I could think was this is the blood of generations. Mm -hmm. You know, the yeah. heart and blood of ger generations. And I look at the people that live there compared to the white areas. And today, the average white family has a net wealth of 171,000. The average black family has a net wealth of 17,000. Right. 10 times the difference, and all because of decisions that were purposefully made in 1930. And so their quilt just <laughs> kind of screams at you, and it's really, really a great experience. It really is. Um, I, I tell people, we of course have taken pictures of it, and we've, we've posted them on, on social media, and, and shown people a picture, it's been in the newspaper. And I tell people, it's, it's one thing to see a picture, it's another thing to see it, to experience it, I think. And, and uh, so we encourage people to come and see it because it's not just the map itself. Like you said, I, I, I tell people they, they, they gave it life uh, because like you said, the colors are more vibrant and it, the colors themselves tell a story. But then there, the other thing about it is this came out of a, a seminar I think they'd had uh, and where they talked about uh, the redlining and, and some of these issues, uh, discriminatory uh, practices in the past and how, the long-term legacy of that. And it's interesting, they took comments from the, the, those who participated, and they've incorporated that into the, the map as well, or into the quilt as well. So they've become pieces of the quilt, and it's, it's really fascinating, I, I think. And uh, we, have it, we have it for a couple of months, and then Sinclair's gonna kind of take it back from us. And, and, uh, and permanent dis I think they're gonna have a permanent display over at Sinclair, but uh, we were happy to do our part. And again, I think it's important because people I, st I still run into people and I start talking about this issue and said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And, and they've, I don't remember studying this when I was in school. I don't think, I don't remember this being part of the curriculum. And uh, so it's interesting, I think, and, and important uh, that we raise awareness on this issue. And this is just one small way that we can do that. And of course, you're living it every day. Yeah, I want to add one thing. Um, and several scholars have brought this up, is that when you take a look at this, and the quilt really shows it, because they have a key that shows what green means and what red, what yellow, what blue. And so that's really good. It's a great educational tool. But when we look at that, we have to remember that the United States used this as a way to perfect economic sanctioning. We know how to economically sanction Russia right. because of what they're doing in Ukraine. We practiced on our own people. We have learned how to do that to North Korea, and they say that one of the problems in North Korea is that our sanctioning doesn't allow good fertilizer into that country, and therefore the farmers can't grow good food, and they have food deserts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I say that to people who live on the west side of Dayton, it always rings a bell with them because we heard before the Jim City Market opened what a food desert sure. the west side was. Sure. And so that economic sanctioning is something that uh, the federal government really needs to recognize and, and, uh, and do something to make the wrong better. All right. So... I want to talk about the, the project that we worked on uh, that you assisted us on here a couple of years ago. That was a great project. Um, you know, my role as a county auditor, I'm the, I'm the assess, chief assessor, and, and we determine property value for taxing purposes. And it's one of the things, given all that we've just said, it's one of the things we're, we're concerned about, about being equitable and fair, uh, but yet at the same time reflecting what's, what's going on in the market, even though the market as we've described it here, the market market itself isn't necessarily fair. Uh, so, but we we still have to follow certain guidelines in order to determine determine values for taxing purposes. So, a few, couple of last time we did a, a countywide revaluation, we uh, I guess contracted with the Fair Housing Center to kind of do a review of of the work that we did, and you did some focus groups, and you want to talk about that a little bit. Sure. So uh, in advance of the 2020 revaluation, 
uh, the reappraisal process, you brought us in between 2018 and 19, and we did a couple of things. First of all, we wanted to look at the last five decades of information from all of the valuations so we could get some type of historical context. Mm -hmm. And so we had hired technicians that looked at that, and they looked at what your office did plus what the mass uh, contractors, the mass appraisal contractors that you hire every six years to go, get out and look at all of these properties and do those valuations. So we w wanted to take a look at that, okay? And so that was, you know, a lot of quantitative data that we were looking at and slicing and dicing. Uh, then we wanted to hear from people. We did, uh, we chose 16 neighborhoods four on the east side and 12 on the west side. And we did it purposefully uh, because we also wanted to look at redlined areas and see what happened to these areas with uh, uh, home valuations with uh, predatory lending, foreclosures, and the bad maintenance of foreclosures. But we wanted to hear from folks and we met many people in all of those neighborhoods that had lived in their homes 50 years or more. Right. They were able to really tell us th the story of how things had ebbed and flowed and valuations had gone up and down according to what kind of crisis was going on, whether right. it was 9-11 or, you know, the Great Recession, you know, all of those things. And Foreclosure crisis, housing, mm -hmm. whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And so what we did was that then you know, so we gathered all this information and uh, we did uh, a fair housing analysis we wanted to know uh, is the process equitable and so we had some key findings and I, I brought a few notes with me because the report was 280 pages long <laughs> and so I thought I can, I'm gonna pull a few things out I want to make sure I get them right so one of the things that we discovered is this is that Dayton is still a highly segregated city and uh, valuations vary greatly due to segregation However, in 1980, Dayton was the third most segregated city in the United States. Not Dayton, but I mean the Dayton metropolitan area. So right. I, uh, I want to correct myself there and make sure that it's not, just not Dayton. It's all of Montgomery County uh, and it Includes like Spring, Springfield and some areas like that around. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but since 1980, we have gone from third to 15th. No. Okay. Okay. So uh, that, and some that, improvement. Yep. Yeah, some improvement. improvement. Uh, that means we are still highly segregated, but that there is a little bit more diversity. So that was a. a but we actually uh, also in that is when I really got to know redlining because we traced this segregation directly to the federal government's actions in the 1930s. So we also found though that. Ohio, of course, law requires that all auditors use the fair market value approach. Correct. And within those constraints, the process by your office and the mass appraisers was what we felt very fair and equitable. And since then, since we published the report and the valuations come out, came out, we have also noticed this. There have been so many, so much less complaints about valuations this time around than other times. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think that you did some things that no one else in the United States does that people should emulate. Number one, you had all of your staff and all of your uh, appraisers go to implicit bias school. Yes, we, yeah, we required all, we required anyone that was involved with it, and the the, uh, the contractor that we were used, we required them to do that, and and you helped us put that together. The right. Fair Housing Center helped us put that together. Right, and so we were uh, really great to be there doing this and watch a lot of people say, "Oh, I didn't realize that I had that racial bias, and uh, or I had that bias against people of this." You know, they were, uh, and they were. Uh, this group of people was so much more aware of the need for equity, 
okay, yes. uh, than any other group. And so uh, we were really pleased, and we hope that in future times that you continue to keep those requirements there. Mm-hmm. So that is, is something. Um, we also found that one of the things that is improved over the last 15 to 20 years is the outreach that your office does to the community. And when we did focus groups, people knew what the valuation process. We asked people, how many have you ever uh, called up the auditor's office and said, gosh, I don't think my value is right. Can we meet? And there were people that did that, and they said they were treated well. Uh, and, and so that's something that we were really happy to hear. You know, here we didn't hear people saying, "Oh, you know, they slammed the door in our face, or they weren't interested <laughs> in hearing us." Uh, and they also told us about meetings that they had been to that you had sponsored, and that uh, bringing the community in for that robust participation—that's what democracy is about. Okay, I mean that is what. Uh, help that's what we were trying to, to accomplish yeah, that was what we were trying to accomplish with all of that no no doubt about it and it was nice to it was good to see uh, have someone an objective uh, observer you know take a look at it and and see what had had we accomplished anything and so uh, that, did it make a difference and I think it does right I, think it does. And, and I don't think you can never do it enough right I don't think you never do it enough we were surprised at, at some finds. We thought we would find some more negatives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, that's kind of the nature of our work. You know, we do an investigation and or do an analysis and you find things that aren't, 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 aren't so great. And so we were really happy uh, to find, you know, those overarching key findings. I mean, we in our report do say, oh, we think that, that some of the data entry needs to be better. Uh, when we were at the Realtors this week and we heard uh, Mr. Pop, you know, show us all the GIS mapping and stuff, and he was explaining to us, uh, you know, that you all, you know, find mistakes and you correct them as, <laughs> a, as you're finding them and stuff like that, and we had found those. So, uh, and so we pointed that out, but in terms of fairness, and equity, that's something that I believe that is achieved in Montgomery County. The project itself was pretty pretty unique. Uh, I don't know of any place else in the country that's doing things like that. Do you? I mean, no place ever has. We ask all of our colleagues, <laughs> okay, and everyone was like, "You're doing what? Yeah. You are so lucky. We would we have died to do that, and our auditor won't talk to us." And do you think some people now have, since we've got this experience and they've seen how it has has worked for us? Do you think there might be? Possibility that others would do this. Everyone has requested the report. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. All across major cities, all across the United States, saying we want to show this to our auto. You know, this is something that that we think we should do. Well, good. Good. Well, I, I think it makes a. Re- I think it makes a difference here in Montgomery County, and uh, hopefully, we can be a, a, a template for other communities and and uh, have a positive impact as well um, in other places. Well, I think we can, and I think that this is really done in the Dayton-Miami Valley spirit of innovation. Okay. Yeah, that's what we're known for, mm-hmm. okay? And this, from a fair housing perspective, was really innovative. Yeah. Well, John, thank you for being with us today. I appreciate it. My guest today was uh, John Zimmerman, the vice president of the Miami Valley Fair Housing Center and, uh, and uh, very knowledgeable on, on fair housing issues and redlining and civil rights and, and go on and on and on, right? He has had a stellar career here, and we're lucky to have him here in, in, uh, in Montgomery County and in Dayton. And so we appreciate you being here today and sharing some of your, some of your uh, expertise with us. And so that's it for today for uh, Odds and Ends. Thanks very much. 